Goedemorgen allemaal. Hoe gaan het met jullie? Oké, okay, so I'm sure there can be a bit of a shock to you. Especially if you are not in our country. Um, so what I'm doing, I'm simply uh, greeting you. And of course, if you were in the US, I might have said howdy or hey, what's up? Um, uh, if you are from Canada, I might say how you doing? Uh, if you're from Oz, of course, good day, mate. Uh, and then France, bonjour. But however we greet you this morning, a warm greeting to you. I guess I'm just kind of getting over the, the way we start these devotions every morning in a very kind of formal good morning, everyone. We trust you are well. Uh, well, I do trust you are well, but uh, let's have a bit of variation. So, uh, good morning, uh, Dumalang, Molo, uh, 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 Saubona, whatever language you choose to receive the greeting this morning anyway on to something a little bit more serious which is coping with stress that we started looking at yesterday and uh, we looked at the two journeys that we need to take the diagnostic journey from symptom to cause and then the remedial journey from cause to remedy and we looked at the story of elijah how he had uh, had this incredible victory at mount carmel over uh, Ahab and Jezebel and then he found himself running for his life into a wilderness uh, sitting under a broom tree uh, wishing that he would die uh, and then uh, lamenting the fact that he was the last prophet left and so on and we looked at some of the symptoms of someone who is facing stress somebody who is really under the cosh as uh, Elijah seemed to be and we said some of those symptoms are things like pride and egotism uh, Elijah saying he was the only prophet left to do God's work uh, which he actually wasn't um, anger and resentment which is often directed towards God as if God was the one who caused us to be in this place uh, loneliness finds himself alone in a wilderness well he was the one who chose to leave his servant not God, but that is just one of the symptoms we have of stress. And then paranoia and fear, where he says, you know, they were after him. You know, they was actually just one woman was after him. And so he exaggerates. And so often when you're stressed, you exaggerate. You know, everybody's out to get me and uh, they all think this of me and so on. And we exaggerate. And then self-pity. Uh, uh, he had his own little pity party under the tree there and then of course depression and he sunk into such a depression that he he wanted uh, his life to be taken from him and so we have the symptoms of stress and this morning we got to look at some of the causes of stress uh, so some from symptom to cause so what are some of the causes well i think number one is that we tend to focus on our feelings rather than the facts emotional reasoning says i feel it so it must be true so elijah said i feel like a failure so i must be one great performers and and athletes uh, know that they've got to ignore the negative feelings they may experience after they've performed especially when they've underperformed otherwise they'll never be ready for the for the next race or the next challenge secondly we compare ourselves to others look at elijah in verse 4 I'm no better than my ancestors. You see, when you do this, you end up comparing others' strengths to your weaknesses. And then you tend to ignore your own strengths. And so you also can label yourself with some derogatory terms. And every time you come short, when you compare yourself with others, it kind of reinforces whatever that derogatory label is that you've given to yourself. And so the Bible says you shouldn't compare yourself to others. Why? Because you have been created uniquely, that you are special in God's sight and you cannot compare yourself to anybody else. So we focus on our feelings rather than the facts. We compare ourselves to others. Thirdly, we blame ourselves for things that aren't our fault. Elijah took the failure of others personally and twice he does that. He felt he should be able to control the actions and the attitudes of others, which is a guaranteed formula for depression. You can influence people, but you cannot control them. 
People don't always respond the way that you want them to or the way you would like. And the more you condemn yourself for the faults, failures and actions of others, the more you will drive yourself to that place of burnout. And so that is the third. We blame ourselves for things that aren't actually our fault. And then lastly, we exaggerate the negative. Um, and again, we saw in verse 10 of how he does exactly that when he says, I have been zealous for the Lord Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. You see, again, that wasn't true. What prophets were put to death? And again, he was not the only prophet left. So you tend to exaggerate the negatives, focus on the negative and fail to see what God is doing in our circumstances and through our circumstances. I think it was C.S. Lewis who said you would ask people how they were. And their usual reply would be, well, under the circumstances, blah, blah, blah. And he would then say to them, well, what are you doing under the circumstances? Get out from there. And I so often want to just use that with people because so often people reply, well, under the circumstances, especially in lockdown, well, under the circumstances, we're okay. You know, well, what are you doing under there? Get out from under the circumstances. We are uh, victorious in Christ. We don't have to be under the circumstances. We have a Lord who tells us we can be above the circumstances. And so those are the four causes just that are apparent from this passage. Focus on our feelings rather than the facts. We compare ourselves to others. We blame ourselves for things that aren't actually our fault. And we exaggerate the negative. And so that's the diagnostic journey from symptom to cause. Now let's begin by looking at the remedial journey. Let us first look at a few basic principles that emerge from God dealing with Elijah. And then we will look more deeply at what I believe God's remedy is for us in terms of coping with stress. So let's look at some of those basics in the remedial journey that God takes Elijah on. First of all, God takes care of his physical needs in verse 5 to 6. He lay down under the bush, fell asleep. At once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. So God provides food for him and gives him rest that strengthens him. That's the first thing that God does. And these are some of the things we need to just take note of, and then we'll look more practically at the application in our own lives. So he takes care of his physical needs. Then secondly, God reveals to him that he cares for him. That he's still with him, in spite of the fact that he might feel that he's been abandoned. So look again at verse 9, and then at verse 13. So he went into the cave, spent the night, and the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And then again in verse 13, the voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So what are you doing, in other words, under these circumstances? Remember, remember Jesus has promised his disciples and by extension to us in Matthew 28, 20, Lo, I will be with you always. And then again in Hebrews 13, 5, that God will never leave us or forsake us. God reminds Elijah that he has not been forsaken. That God actually didn't leave him. It was he who left God. There's no indication that God told him to go into the wilderness. God certainly didn't tell him to lie under a broom tree and ask for his life to be taken from him. It was his decision. And so often we find ourselves in a wilderness and then we blame God as if it is God who drove us there. Now sure, there are times like Jesus when God does drive us into a wilderness to teach us some lessons. But most of the time, we are the ones who, who drive ourselves into a wilderness by neglecting worship and neglecting fellowship and neglecting reading His Word and spending time with God and so on. And so we can't always blame God for the circumstances we find ourselves in. And so God basically shows him that He still cares for him. He shows up and says to Elijah, what are you doing here? 
Then thirdly, through a dual question again, those two questions in verse 9 and 13, God gives Elijah the opportunity to voice his feelings, to vent, to kind of express what's in his heart. And that's exactly what he does in verse 10. And we read it a few times. I've been zealous for the Lord and so on, etc., etc. And so he vents. God knows that when we express our, our real feelings out in the open, especially to God, there is, there is comfort in that. There is release in that. We are able to see uh, them realistically for what they really are and to deal with them. And that's exactly what we have seen in the Psalms over and over again. David is forever voicing uh, and venting his feelings to God. And we need to be able to do the same. And so God gives us opportunity to do so. He asks the question, what are you doing here? He didn't expect a rhetoric answer. It wasn't a rhetorical question. He wanted Elijah to respond, and Elijah did, and that in some measure lifts the burden from him. Then number four, after exposing his feelings, God goes on to give Elijah new tasks. Have a look at verse 15 to 16. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came. And go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, and Abel, Melhola, to succeed you as prophet. Okay, so there is an instruction. He tells Elijah to go back the way that he came to the wilderness of Damascus, where he is to anoint kings and prophets. And so God really gives Elijah a new sense of purpose. You see, when we allow stress to overcome us, we no longer do what God has called us to do. Prophets are supposed to be proclaiming God's revelation to, to people, not sitting under broom trees, feeling sorry for themselves, lamenting over their lot in life. They were called by God to proclaim his word. And so God kind of gives Elijah a new purpose. He, he puts him in a new direction. He sends him back the way he's come. And he tells him to do what he should have been doing in the first place. And that is going and anointing kings and prophets. And so that is number four. And then the last thing we want to say uh, in terms of this remedial journey, God gives him a genuine friend in Elisha. And we'll read more about that in the subsequent chapters. But from that moment onwards, Elisha becomes a close friend, a co-worker, a disciple of Elijah. And as we know, ultimately his successor. And I doubt that Elijah ever again sat under a broom tree lamenting over his lot in life. Because he now had somebody that he could share his burdens with. And so we will take that to a far more personal level next time when we look at this remedial journey. But just from those, I'm sure you can already pick out some of the things that we need to be doing if we are going to remedy uh, the stress that is in our lives. So bless you. Let's just close in a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you for your word again. We thank you, Lord, that in spite of these symptoms, you enabled Elijah to understand the causes of those symptoms. And when he did, he was able to get up and return the way that he had come and to do what you had commanded him to do. And Lord, we, we know that sometimes we can get bogged down when we are stressed. We can feel that we're in a hole and we want to break out. And Lord, I just pray that whoever finds himself in such a place this morning, that you would just reach out to them, that Lord, they would just take you by the hand, that you would lift them out of that pit of despair and that pit of stress and enable them to see things as you see them. And so I truly pray that you would just go before us into this day, that you would give us a new vision, a new focus, that we are not... Uh, focus on our feelings, but rather focus on the facts. And the facts are, Lord, that you love us. You never leave us or forsake us. You promise that you will be with us always, even until the end of the age. And so, Lord, we hold on to those promises. We take you by the hand as our good shepherd. And, Lord, we just pray that you would lead us in the ways of the Lord. And so bless us as we continue into this day. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. And uh, tot ziens for those of you who are local. And uh, uh, goodbye to, to the rest of you. Amen. See you in the morning.